Okay, good morning, everybody. It's Kill Casey with you here on Saturday morning, October 3rd, our 18th day in a row of doing the live Break It Down series. Special guest today, Brad Washaw. He's our strategic operations planner and also our new fire behavior analyst. So he's going to help us understand how we plan for fire movement and growth and what have you. But first, real quick, we just want to give you a couple points for the day. For one, we thank everybody who wants to support our firefighters in the spike camps and Hay Fork and at TLC, the camp off to the west near Dinsmore. But please be reminded that firefighters have what they need now. The camps are fully set up. They have towels, they have food, they have uh, meals and showers and everything that they need. So if you're looking to support the fire crews, the best way to do it is with thank you signs that can lift their spirits as they drive to and from the fire line and then stamped postcards so that they can write letters home to their children on their wife's anniversary, whatever it is, and also supporting your local fire department. Make a donation, volunteer your time, focus on that local fire department. We don't need any supplies, we don't need any towels, the firefighters have what they need, we just want to make sure we clear that up. And then also for the folks in the Ruth Valley and Hettenshaw, we spoke with Cal Fire Chief Meisner today, he's here as part of our team, and he wanted to let you know that Cal Fire is doing all that they can, that they are also stretched thin, that there's never a time when they're invited to come and they don't come and or that they're kept out of the area. They have engines working all around the Shasta Fire, the Napa Fires, Humboldt District. And so we just wanted to clear that up, that there's a perception that there is a limitation on CAL FIRE's presence. That is not true. When they do bring their engines in these days, they have to bring in contracted engines because they're stretched so thin. We just wanted to clear that up. And now our special guest, Brad. Brad's got a long career in fire. You're what we kind of, what I would like to achieve some days, the understandings that you have, because you can look at the fuels, you can look at modeling, you have all this software, and you can build out these models that help us understand where we're going. Sounds good. So uh, from a fire behavior standpoint, um, we'll start at what's happening today and then look at futuring out. Um, right now, one of the important things to consider is the uh, North Ops has issued a fire and fuels advisory. That's been out all September, and I think actually even before that. But they have updated that again um, on the 29th of September. So the fuels are critically dry. Um, so that is a definite concern for us. Yeah, are we talking as, about grasses, bushes, trees, or just one of those? All when of we them. When we talk about fuels. Everything when okay. we talk about fuels. So everything from the fine fuels, the grasses that have cured out, to the large 1,000-hour-plus fuels um, on the ground. Okay. So. That, that is concern and that's really a driver in this fire. Um, the other two elements that we have to look at as far as drivers in the fire is topography. As you know where the fire is in many locations, um, very steep topography um, and that's a, a, a major driver. And then the other uh, element um, is the winds. Um, we, when we saw the fire blow out here while we were here and across the 36 road, that was because of winds um, that came through that east wind event. And then the other main thing is, you know, with the smoke out there, that does impact how the fire behaviors, behaves. Um, you know, if you've if you got smoke, a lot of times it kind of caps off our fire behavior. But uh, when that smoke clears, we get clear skies and solar radiation hitting the fuels themselves, um, we see more active fire behavior. So as far as today, we do have some fire behavior here on the uh, east side of the fire. They are, the fire is kind of working itself down here and they're just trying to stay in check with it along the 35 road to keep the uh, fire from coming out here with any steam. So they are putting fire on the ground. And that's the intended containment line for folks at home who are tracking this. The, the 35 road is where we'd like it to end, right? Yes, and they're taking that into the buck fire. This fire that's been around, or this heat that's been around the buck fire has been there since before we got here. Um, that buck fire was 2017 and that's holding up the fire there. We also, on the north end, just above or below, south of the 36 road, we do have fire that's backing into the old blue fire, and uh, we're just kind of allowing that to back on its own. They are doing a little bit of ignition here just to keep it in check so that it doesn't have the chance of hooking around there. And again, just for folks to break it down, this you'd like the fire line to be the 36 road in this point right here. This is uh, post Mountain Trinity Pines, right? Yes. You come up and over and you'd like to see that be the final footprint for this fire. Definitely, yes. Okay, got it. We don't want it just, we want, we want some containment line that it's bumped up against, not that it's, you know, if a wind event came through here that it could blow out there. So we are letting it back down and, and plan is to 36 road, and then we've got improved forest roads here. Um, as we move farther north where the fire did cross the 36 road, 
Um, they are having good success holding that in check with the 14 road, but they have put in some contingency lines um, out in front of that in case they are not able to hold it there. And we are getting more resources in, so that's been helpful. Where earlier on when it did cross the 36 road, there weren't a lot of resources to uh, help with that. Then we have the, uh, the uh, where, where it has crossed the uh, Trinity River. It's the Hidden Valley area? Right? Yes, the Hidden Valley. Yep. Um, they are doing point protection. They have put hand line in there. Uh, beyond the Trinity Valley area, they also have been able to put dozer line into the river bottom there. So down to the Trinity. As we come down towards the Mad River uh, drainage here, down towards Ruth and that, um, this area is one area where we have seen where the smoke has been clearing and have had a little more fire activity. And we have also been working with Cal Fire as far as uh, improving some contingency lines to hold it. One part of their contingency line, the fire has crossed over and they are trying to catch that in check. And, uh, and is that crossing over, Brad, just so you can help us understand, is that through any lack of effort or is it lofting embers and spot fires? And that's a big dozer line and we all know that we have a lot of dozers working. I mean, look at all this dozer line, right? There's dozer line everywhere, but it seems like the fire, is it lofting over the dozer line? I'm not sure the, the mechanism right there specifically, but I'm guessing there were some spots that came over the dozer line. And, uh, we talked that. about that probability of ignition yesterday was like 90%. So if there was 100 embers, then 90 would get started. Exactly. Yes. And we have some folks in the area here who are kind of wishing we would wait for the fire to come more to some of these dozer lines. But in some certain uh, situations, it's much better to light them and let it pull back into the main fire. Yes. I know we're going into the weeds of tactics, but we're trying to address some of those community concerns out there. There are a lot of folks who have been stressed out in the Ruth and Hedenshaw area and they're trying to figure out how this all works. Suffice it to say, it is dry, right? Definitely, and it the moves, are dry, yes. moves easily. What is your modeling show? How do you use modeling? So next, if we could show the one slide. Um, this is called an FS Pro Run, and we don't always show this to the public, just because uh, without an explanation to it, um, there's a lot of limitations and assumptions. It is a model. Uh, we basically say all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, this does help us inform us where the fire would go. Uh, some things you need to assume. First of all, this, was, this model was based on 1,000 fires. So they, they modeled 1,000 fires from where we saw heat two days ago. Um, this, this model was run last night. So it was basically the IR flight from two nights ago. Um, where that was showing heat, we uh, simulated ignitions coming off at that point. It's assuming that there's no, no suppression operations going on. So they're not doing anything that's trying to uh, to um, stop the fire so that the model doesn't figure that there's dozer line and we're trying to use the 14 road or that we're putting fire down along the 35 road. It's assuming the fire's free roaming. Uh, see some other assumptions with it. Um, we, we've done a lot of, we've had good success with looking at these models just because early on there wasn't a lot of resources here to do suppression action. So um, we have been able to calibrate the model to the fuels and to uh, the fire behavior we have been experiencing. What this shows is not what the perimeter necessarily would be of the fire. It shows the probability of the fire actually hitting that point. So the red on here would show that there's an 80 to 100% probability over the next 10 days that fire is going to hit that. And also inputs put into this model were three days of actual weather forecasts. We know forecasts aren't always um, right on. So, you know, there's always that thing that goes into the model. And then the next seven days are based on climatological data. So those are some of the inputs into that. One thing we are hearing in the forecasts is uh, next weekend possibly a change in the weather. So that would not be, be picked up by this model. And we could possibly see some precip, uh, you know, with that change. You know, it's still a ways out, but uh, it does look like we might see at least some sort of change in the weather. Whether or not it'll be like what we just saw, um, um, recently, when the frontal passage came through, we basically got the winds and no precip, but uh, you know, there is some encouragement that there, there might be some precip along with that. So that the red shows there's an 80 to 90 percent chance of the fire reaching that area. Um, some points of, of interest like Hay Fork or High and Palm, um, it's showing that the fire would not reach there. Um, to the south of those locations, you know, that, that very light pink on there is a less than 2 or 0.2 percent chance of the fire reaching those areas. So, uh, um, you know, and then the, there's the various gradients within there. So this helps us to look at where we need to put emphasis. So if we weren't doing any suppression action on like the east side, for example, uh, that area, you know, mm -hmm. that would, um, 
you know, there's, there's a good chance that, that that part of the fire would become significantly larger if we weren't taking action on that point right there. And so, yet every day they're working the helicopters, the air attacks flying over the east side. I listen to the radio when I'm out there mm -hmm. driving around like you do, and you can always hear the chatter of the crews working in this area, which is why it's still within our containment lines, right? And so if this were unstaffed or this were a wilderness fire, your models show where it would go. Exactly. And that's where you just want to make sure folks at home understand this model that you just saw is insider information for planning purposes. It's what ha it's, it's actually one of the most in interesting tools for folks like me who've been on the line but didn't really ever get that science that you got, that train that you got, because there's so many different variations. I mean, you have river corridors, you have roads, you have all these different factors. And then, of course, it could rain next weekend, and we're starting to hear more about temperatures dropping, cooling off. We might actually get an event next weekend that helps us out more than just this calm. Because we all know that calm is sort of the calm before the wind around here. That's what mm -hmm. the last 45 days has been, right? We get four or five days of calm, we start getting more dozer line in, we start getting some containment, and then we brace for the wind. In this case, we could be bracing for some moisture. Exactly. And, and there's likely there's going to be some prefrontal mo uh, winds um, associated with that system. And, and that system actually is, a, is Hurricane Maria, I think it is, um, is what, I, what I've been seeing. So. Excellent, thank you. And any other thoughts on, I know um, the, the Pacific Northwest Team 2, who are gonna introduce one of their information officers, Chris Barr, uh, right now, he's coming in, but uh, they'll be taking over kind of management of this direction. That really doesn't change anything for the firefighters on the ground, correct? Everybody no, we're just... splitting up the firefighters, and, and those firefighters that are over here are gonna stay there. Firefighters that are here are staying in place. Um, there'll be some new mid-level and upper-level management in there, but uh, for the most part, operations on the ground will not change. Great, thank you so much, Bab, we appreciate it. We know you've got all those computers to go look at, <laughs> and then those get reported out to the firefighters and they build their plans, so thanks. Well, thanks. We appreciate yeah. it, man. Have a good day. Thank you, and Chris Barth, my, uh, both my friend and counterpart, uh, we actually work on this sister team, Pacific Northwest Team 2, together. I live in, in Alaska now. Chris came up to help us two or three times last summer to Alaska. Chris was originally from Colorado. I was originally from Colorado. We met dozens of years ago. So as we look at how these teams integrate, we really are a fire family. We've talked about the Green Pants Nation. Mm -hmm. um, some of the more important people <laughs> wear beige and, and brown pants. That shows a little more of the, uh, the uh, because you have a long fire career. Chris, why don't you introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, again, Chris Barth, uh, Public Information Officer with Pacific North Northwest Team 2. And yeah, so to address Kill's comment there, I, I did begin uh, starting uh, in operations about 28 years ago and, and have been really focused on uh, public information and working with communities uh, really for like the last 15, 18 years. Uh, so yeah, it is, it's great to work with Kale, great to work with Alaska team. Uh, we, not just Kale and I, but the, the teams um, really close. We have a lot of overlap and work uh, together. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are interchangeable amongst those teams. So we do have that, that tight connection. Um, it's, it's a really natural fit for us to be working together um, here on this. And so your audience uh, knows um, Pacific Northwest Team 2 had been on the south zone uh, of the August complex and, and we still are, um, are working on that. We've, we've been here for about five or six days, uh, but again, a lot of that south zone is in patrol and monitor status. Uh, along the, the, the uh, eastern side of, and down south, uh, had some uh, really focused on the Lake Pillsbury area, and then coming up here into the western side of the south zone, uh, working with CAL FIRE on, on uh, in, in CAL FIRE 5's management on the, the SRA portion with uh, some of our resources there on the state, uh, state response. responsibility area, yep. and then our uh, Pacific Northwest 2 folks working really close together with them on the FRA, or the federal response area. Um, so that's been going on. And as was introduced uh, just a few minutes ago uh, by Kale and Brad, uh, we, the Pacific Northwest Team 2 is gonna be moving uh, a good amount of our resources, keeping some on that south end to continue to, to uh, hold that and keep that patrolled and monitored. Uh, but bringing some resources, moving an incident command post to, to Eureka. Um, so we have that mid, high, uh, upper level management for firefighters on this northwestern portion of what has been the north zone. Um, so that's happening. Uh, it, that has been happening, I should say. Our operations folks are really closely tied in with Alaska operations 
folks, making sure um, that situational awareness about what's been going on, that's been very closely uh, communicated. Um, we communicate about the needs of the public and the community and serving that, and I guess really just to put a fine point on it, um, our goal is to make sure there's no disruption in how folks are getting the information, right? Because this is, this is one large fire. It's important that uh, we're talking about it as one large fire complex. Um, and we know that there are some very important specific things that people need to know about um, in that area, because this is a huge area. So we, 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 we talk about complex, <laughs> but we know how important it is to talk about Hyapam and Ruth and Lake Pillsbury, all those very um, specific places, because that's what matters to folks here online. The North Zone, Chris, 320 miles of fire line, 120 something controlled, 200 and something still working on. That's 32% of just the north zone that's contained. Overall containment, 51%. This is a massive, almost million acre fire. Right. So thanks for reminding folks that when we point around these maps, we're used to doing this on a 50,000 acre fire. This is a 978, 80,000 acre big deal. So you'll be taking the responsibility mm -hmm. operationally. So operations chiefs and branch directors from PNW2 will be working with the communities in Booth Valley, Mad River, Hett and Shaw, Ketton Palm and Xenia now Cal Fire still has jurisdiction over the West Zone and their updates are on the Cal Fire page. We do get folks from Alder Point, Xenia, and even Island Mountain and around who want to know. And remember, uh, when you come to the Shasta Trinity or the Six Rivers Facebook page, you're, you're, you're going to get information more about the forested area here. When you go to the Cal Fire West Zone page, you're going to get the updates you're looking for. So that's just a little traffic control area there. And then it's kind of neat to tie in what Brad does because when folks hear us doing structure protection and assessments out in Mad River, Van Dusen, and Dismore, that's as we build that modeling. Mm -hmm. And it would be irresponsible to not have a model to tell us where this fire is going to go, right? So on the one hand, you look at a model and you're like, wow, but uh, that's kind of scary. But on the other hand, so is looking at this red. Not everything in here burned at the same intensity. We put video up of driving down the road in Ruth Valley yesterday so you could see that the flashy fuels are burning very quickly and they're all black, but a lot of the trees actually still have their canopy and all that. So just like this red blob is scary, the progression map can be scary, but we're also, we've been scouting for days out here. Your people will pick up that structure protection element and all those other responsibilities, taking care of the firefighters that are out at that camp. That remote camp becomes your camp, but it's really one big fire family. Absolutely, absolutely. And as you said, like, again, you know, our, our goal is to, um, Firefighter and life safety, public firefighters serving their needs and getting information to folks about what's going on. Um, our, our job as incident management teams, and again, we, we really do have a close, strong bond with uh, our counterparts on each of the teams, is to make sure that there's uh, a seamless and, and, and really no um, perceived difference in how that's been happening. So, um, yeah, but that, that will, uh, we'll, our Pacific Northwest team too will, will continue to service the firefighters on the ground here, developing uh, plans very similar to what Brad and, and some of the other things you've heard about on, on this series um, talking about. Um, as as Kale was mentioning, you know, there's a lot of fire on the ground here. There's a lot of fire on the ground across California and, and Pacific Northwest as well, although that's improving. Um, so there are some limited resources. So looking at those models, looking at the resources that we have and putting the right resources in the right place at the right time. And that's why that's a valuable tool um, where, where there's active fire. Uh, where we need to put those folks and then developing those, um, you know, primary alternate contingency uh, planning so that we have all those things in place and using those things very pr uh, with precision to make sure that they're where they need to be. The old PACE model, primary exactly. alternate contingency emergency. We don't do anything without four plans. Speaking of plans, the Alaska team's last day, because we've gotten this question a lot, and we appreciate that support. I know we've, we've all really enjoyed working here and it's been uh, just a great time to, to work with you. Our goal is to help you sleep at night, right? That's our main mission, the reason why we get up here every day and are so passionate about wanting all of your questions because it helps us understand how to get answers to you and help you rest more assured knowing who's on the ground watching your back. We time out on the 6th, so that's in a few days now. That means another incident management team is coming in to relieve us. We typically do 14-day assignments, and this was extended to a 21 at the request of the Area Command and the Forest, so we've, we're on day 18. That's why we've done 18 live days in a row. Great Basin incident management team that was managing the south side of the fire, mm -hmm. they went home about 10 days ago. They got rests after their assignment. 
as fate would have it, they're coming back in to take over our side, which will now be considered the northeast. And so you'll see that transition happen beginning Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That's that. So we have two transitions. With our team here, our sister team, very smooth. And then we have the Great Basin team that was on this fire for uh, two or three weeks. will be coming up to take the north. So we'll keep messaging about that. And I'll, you know, just, just for transparency, again, another one, as I mentioned, uh, Pacific Northwest Team 2 will still be uh, managing the south zone, but in, in, in some point in the near future, there'll be a transition uh, with an incoming team for um, ongoing right. um, you know, mop-up mop patrol, rehab, all those kind of things, suppression repair that are going to be taking place on the south zone. Um, but again, the important piece, again, it's important to talk about these things, to be transparent and share them with everybody. Um, but as we talked about with the model, there's caveats to that. So again, this is one large complex. We work really closely together. Um, our goals are, are in parallel and they're, they're unified in, in making sure we get information, we protect the communities, we work with our partners and serve the need. Um, so there, this is one large complex. We're gonna continue to work together. They're, they're, really um, we want to make sure that the important piece is that we tell the story of what's happening here and then get into the details of, of very specific about what's going on on this piece and what's going on on that piece so that you have the information you need absolutely uh, mike and jacob and brad and josh behind the cameras any questions from the audience now well a number of comments are very thank you so much for all the in-depth information and several several people commenting they really appreciate the modeling as well um, great. So do have something for Brad if there's time. Okay, great. And we and we also want to, uh, not every strategic operations planner comes up here and does what Brad did. So I want to make sure that everybody knows and not every team throws cameras all around their people and say, hey, go live and talk to the whole audience because that's, that is a pressure point. So thank you, Brad. We appreciate it. Sure. So a couple questions related to smoke. And I'm not going to go, you know, step up, we're asking fine details about this location, that location. What we're seeing, at least for today's forecast, is, you know, we're having a north, northwesterly wind, and we are seeing some clearing on the west side of our fire. So we do anticipate some of the smoke clearing along the west side of the fire today. Um, that's both a good and a bad thing. One that does allow us to get aviation resources into the fire. And uh, so that's a good thing, but we usually do get increased fire behavior because the sun's hitting the fuels, drying them out faster and uh, that. So we do anticipate seeing some clearing on the west side. Um, with that north, northwesterly flow, you know, that's gonna probably put more, more smoke over in, in this part of the fire. There was also a question about what are we doing with some of these interior pockets of fire? Um, those are largely in inaccessible wilderness areas and those interior pockets we are not putting resources into those areas. Your model did show them eventually filling in, though. They, they have been showing that they, they would eventually show filling. This has taken a while. It, it has, yeah. So, and, and part of it, I mean, there's a lot of this area has a lot of history of large fires occurring. So, some of it's burning into old areas like the Buck Fire. You know, it, it burnt in there, but it basically stopped. So there are some fires in here that are kind of holding it in check too. So, but great. eventually the models over the the 10 day period. Uh, show that it would uh, fill in. And, and again, that model doesn't show that, that we might get some precip uh, next weekend either, so. Excellent, thank you, appreciate Please. it. Any other questions? Well, I'll just ask that, uh, will, will the next uh, firefighters coming in keep us as updated as you have? We're looking for a seamless transition, and we, you know, Chris and Sarah and his team are, are have the same technology that we do, and um, everybody wants the same outcome for the public, which is keeping you informed. Those YouTube videos will keep coming. Jacob Welch is right here. I'm gonna take him out on the line today and he'll take that baton and run with it. Uh, the most important thing is we're all in this together. So the citizens out there who, um, you know, who are concerned about what's going on in Ruth Valley and Hettenshaw, we feel that, we understand that, we're in this together. Let's get, get to this together. And as Chief uh, Meisner said this morning from Cal Fire, they're doing what they can when they can and there's no restrictions on them coming in and helping out. The limitation is resources. So just like the chief said, he has engines all over the Humboldt district and we just wanna make sure that folks are sharing the right information. We know that there can be frustrations and assumptions out there, but please, for the benefit of the firefighters, let's go ahead and stay focused on getting through this one day at a time together. And it doesn't matter who's behind the camera, or who's in the pants, we're all one fire family and we appreciate your support today and thank you so much.